Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for the uh, invitation. It's a really interesting day. I've had a look at the program. It's a very impressive range of research studies uh, going on here. So that's great. Okay, to, to the matter in hand. Fertility tourism. Infertility is a major problem. It's a major medical problem. It's also a very significant social problem. It affects around one in seven couples in the UK. Yeah, one in seven couples have difficulty uh, achieving uh, a pregnancy. And about 80 million women are worldwide are regarded as um, subfertile. And for those people who can't have children, it's uh, you know the social and, and the psychological consequences of this are can often be very severe. It can lead to, to great um, sadness, <coughs> feelings of loss, and for some people, to, to more serious forms of depression. And this is particularly the case, of course, in those cultures where there is a very heavy uh, price to pay for, for childlessness in terms of stigma. Um, and the motherhood m mandate is so strong that women in particular who, who can't have children um, can suffer um, great distress. Now... Thankfully, for some people at least, there is help on the horizon. Around 40 million women worldwide are actually seeking treatment for infertility. And we know since uh, the, the birth of uh, Louise Brown, 1978, the first test tube baby, that IVF has given rise to around 4 million babies in the world. And there's an annual rate of about 300,000. So some people then can have a successful treatment to help them to have a child. But there are many who still have difficulty. Uh, IVF, yes, it is a miracle technology in many ways, but still less than half of people who enter uh, fertility treatment come out with a baby. Okay? So although it is, uh, many advances are being made, it's still not uh, by any means an entirely kind of successful <coughs> enterprise. It's been regarded historically and particularly in the media I think up, up until probably about 10 years ago as a sort of as a, as a miracle technology. It's been regarded as one of those you know man-made wonders and you know treated with, with quite a kind of positive spin, really, by the media, bringing joy to millions of couples who would otherwise be denied parenthood. There's always been people who've been opposed to any kind of uh, intervention in human reproduction, be it to, to enable conception or, or to uh, prevent it. Um, but generally speaking, until fairly recently... The, the kind of ethical challenges which were around at the time that IVF was first developed over 30 years ago seems to have subsided. <coughs> but I think more recently these challenges have come back and I think they've come back with a vengeance. I think IVF is now under public scrutiny as never before. Largely, I think, as a result of some headline-hitting cases. Yeah? The idea of sex selection, for example, using assisted conception, the idea of designer babies. Okay? So we've now, I think, got a, a rather different take, in, certainly in, in the media, on what this technology means and what it's offering. You may recall uh, a couple of cases here, for example, the, the controversy over uh, Carmen Busada, who was a Spanish woman who was single, and she had twin boys at the age of 67 using IVF a few years ago. And uh, subsequently, she sadly died um, from cancer, leaving the, those infants um, two and a half years old. And that had a lot, of, a lot of publicity around that. And then there was the case of Octomum. Yeah, here's the, the octuplets here on the, on the right. as a, a, a Californian woman who had... Um, octuplets in defiance of warnings of course that multiple pregnancies are as we know closely linked to difficulties children born with abnormalities and developmental problems and so on 
So I think in contrast to these, the earlier perception of new reproductive technologies as being yeah, wonderful, miracle technologies, there are, I think, now growing concerns about abuses of fertility treatment <coughs> and the social implications of these. And within this new, more critical gaze, the phenomenon of people travelling, crossing borders, travelling the world to get pregnant... I think has created a, a particular public anxiety. So this phenomenon, fertility tourism, as it's come to be um, popularly known, <coughs> has received a great deal of attention in the media um, over recent years. And most of it, most of this attention has been pretty hostile, pretty negative. And it has to be said that uh, until fairly recently, most of the debate about people travelling for conception has actually been in the newspapers and the magazines rather than an, in academic debate. That's slightly changing now. We have more studies actually coming through. But largely, we were left with these media images. So, who's doing this? It's the, it's the left it too late mums, yeah? The selfish career woman, the postmenopausal woman seeking a designer baby going off to dodgy clinics in some foreign countries, having a holiday, and coming back carrying triplets. Okay. So there are these uh, media accounts, then, of pretty negative accounts of people, horror stories about people's experiences overseas. You know, abroad is never seen to as quite live up to British standards of cleanliness and care. Um, so most of this reporting, then, is highly negative. But is this the reality of cross-border fertility treatment? And that's what I want to talk about today. So first of all, just to look at what do we know about the extent of cross-border reproductive travel, how much of this so-called fertility tourism is there? Why? Why do we think this is happening? Why are people increasingly crossing borders to access treatment? How do they experience their overseas quest for conception? I'll say just a little bit about that. Um, you can ask some questions about that perhaps later. And then finally, should we be concerned about it? Is it an issue to be, to be worried about? Is it a problem? And if it is a problem, what is the nature of that problem and who is it a problem for? So, start off with trying to understand how much of it is it major issue or not. How many people are actually on the move? Well, again, it's very hard to find any kind of systematic data. There's very little data collection on this. As far as Europe's concerned, I think our best estimate is from a study carried out by um, Francois Schenfield and colleagues, which was published last year. And they looked at six European countries and they estimated that... Um, something like between 11 and 14,000 patients <coughs> were crossing borders for fertility treatment each year in, in these six European countries. That's quite a, quite a number. It probably equates, they said, to about 25 to 30,000 cycles of IVF occurring across borders. But it's not just a European phenomenon. We've actually got Americans... Uh, are coming to Europe, and Europeans go to America. The Japanese go to America, and the wealthy elites from Africa, the Middle East, and indeed South America also come to, to Europe and, and to the US. So there's always been a certain amount of travel, in fact, and many of the, the, uh, the top private clinics in London, for example, have always had uh, a lot of overseas uh, people coming um, to, to access treatments uh, in London, usually because the, the kind of more advanced technologies are not necessarily available in, yeah, in, in many parts of the world. Within Europe, uh, so it is a global issue, within Europe there is this crazy uh, <coughs> patchwork of travel going on. So you've got Germans going to Spain, Italians to Greece and Spain, Israelis to Romania and the Ukraine, the French, the French go to Belgium, <coughs> the Dutch and the Swedes are going to Denmark, and <laughs> the Irish go to the Czech Republic and the Ukraine, and the Turks go to Cyprus and Romania, so there's all this kind of, and more, okay, so there's all this kind of 
crossing borders. What on earth is going on? How can we make sense of this seemingly kind of anarchic um, patchwork of patient movements? But before I try to answer that question, it's important to point out that it's not actually just people that are moving here. Objects are moving as well. Um, objects in motion, the um, globalisation uh, theorist, Aparadjuai, he talks about objects in motion. And the objects in question here, of course, are gametes, eggs, sperms and embryos. These are increasingly what's moving around the globe. Patients actually don't really need to move, other than for legal reasons, as we'll say in a moment. We've now we've had sperm, frozen sperm, travelling for quite some time. With new techniques in egg vitrification, yeah, it's much more easy now to successfully freeze an egg, then defrost it and use it. Um, we're seeing a lot more eggs moving around. And of course, frozen embryos yeah, also can be transported. So we can have a situation of... Uh, a sperm coming from the Danish cryobank, meeting up with an egg coming from who knows where, maybe a Romanian woman, um, and then the resulting embryo going off to North America to be implanted in a, an American woman. Okay, So we've actually got gametes travelling the world, not just people. So why? Why cross borders? In a recent paper, um, we've linked this uh, growth of cross-border travel to uh, broader processes of globalisation, and therefore to the, the social and the economic and the political context, which has enabled um, a growth in patient mobility. Technology, as I've said, has come on a pace, Lots of different techniques being developed, which is pushing the, the, the industry, the business forward. Also, economic and cultural globalisation. The, uh, the foreign is now much more familiar. Yeah? We, we travel a lot. We, we're very familiar with abroad. And, of course, it's also easier. Cheap travel, Ryanair. BMI baby has a whole new meaning in this context. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and the growth of the internet and the information revolution, this is really, really important in this context because clinics in different parts of the country are able to advertise, yeah, and you can advertise your, your, your systems, you can advertise your donors. If any of you have been on any of these websites, it's quite amazing. Um, you can look at a whole kind of list of traits and photographs of, uh, of egg donors and sperm donors and choose yeah, who, who you want, etc. Quite amazing for the internet. But also the internet's importance in giving patients information and to some extent confidence as well in, um, in travelling abroad. There's a lot of um, communication on the internet, on various forum, fora um, between patients. And this is really, really important in the study I'm going to t tell you about uh, in a minute. So patients can, or potential people travelling, can communicate with each other, and they can easily communicate with clinics abroad. But at the same time that there are these globalising tendencies, you know, making the world a smaller place, which is basically what globalisation is, the actual regulation of assisted reproductive technologies has remained largely local. Okay, so there are some there are some kind of European tissue directive, for example, which is kind of pan-European. But generally speaking, what you can do in ART, who who you can do it to, yeah, and the kinds of treatment you can have, etc., are still determined by individual nation states, local jurisdictions, and indeed individual states where there are state systems. So in Australia and in, in um, the US, for example, it's very variable according to different states what's allowed. Okay, so you've got a lot of various uh, local variation in, ki in what kinds of treatments are allowed and what categories of people can access those treatments. So even within Europe then, you've actually got countries where egg donation treatment is banned, PGD treatment is banned, so Germany, Austria, Turkey, you can't have any 
egg donation treatment. Next door to, yeah, Turkey, countries where this is perfectly legal. Okay, so naturally, yeah, there is kind of movement. You've got countries like France. We looked at the French going to, um, where were they going to Belgium? Um, France will not treat single women and it will not treat lesbian women. Okay, so those categories of women go to next door. To Belgium, where marital status and sexual orientation is no bar to treatment. Okay, and then we've got a country like Italy. Now, Italy used to be the Wild West of fertility treatment. You could do anything to anybody at any time. It was, really, was the Wild West. Then they introduced a really restrictive law in 2004, really closed down a lot of avenues, and there was a mass <coughs> exodus, not just of patients, but also of clinicians too, um, crossing the border yeah, to set up clinics um, in other European countries. Okay, so there is the, the, the globalizing tendencies which makes it easier for us to all move around. On the other hand, there is these local differences which mean that some people can now travel but need to travel in some cases to get the kind of treatment that they require. Now, interestingly, in the case of the UK, those legal restrictions aren't actually that important. And I just want to talk to you now about the study that um, we undertook of UK residents who travel abroad uh, for fertility treatment. It's the first study, I think, of, of this in, in the UK um, context, and we received funding from um, the ESRC. I won't give you the details of the methodology. We can talk about that later if you like. But basically, it's a qualitative study. We recruited 51 participants, 41 women and 10 men with experience of um, cross-border fertility travel. And one of our aims was to, if you like, to try and get behind that media image that I showed earlier, yeah? to look at, at the reality of uh, fertility um, travel. And as you might imagine, uh, certainly what, what we found contradicted this dominant media <laughs> image um, in several different ways. So I just want to look at what our study um, told us about why UK, UK people, women uh, in particular, <coughs> are, are going overseas for treatment. Where they went, what their outcomes were. Why were people going abroad? Um, lots of different reasons, basically. It was quite, and, and often interrelated reasons. Few people actually had a single um, reason. Their mot <coughs> motivations were often multifaceted and quite varied. Cost was an important consideration for many of the, the cases that we, um, we looked at. Although this wasn't an overriding issue um, for most of those we spoke to, it was a consideration. And I think this is only likely to, to become more evident as we're now seeing a retrenchment of IVF provision in the NHS. Yeah, many PCTs have, uh, have reduced the, the availability. It did get better over the last couple of years following the, the NICE guidelines and a lot of campaigning. And now we've, we're beginning to see a retrenchment in hard times, that funding is, is falling. Some uh, PCTs were, have suspended the, their IVF uh, treatment altogether. So people are forced into the private sector anyway, and it's not cheap, okay? You're looking at a minimum, what, four, five thousand pounds per cycle um, for relatively straightforward treatment and, and much more for anything um, more complex or involving a third party, okay? So cost is going to be an issue for people if you're faced with, with rising costs, and you need several cycles of treatment, yeah? Many people get into debt, they remortgage their homes and so on go to extreme lengths to, to, to have that desired child. Some people were actually motivated by a dissatisfaction with the treatment they'd had in the UK. And the important thing here is many people that we spoke to had had treatment in the UK. As I'll say in a minute, they weren't just people who thought, oh, right, I think I'll have fertility treatment, now I'll go to Spain. Yeah? Many of them had actually been in treatment for quite a long time uh, before they took that rather often rather difficult decision. 
And they weren't too happy with the treatment they'd had in the UK, and they thought, I'm going to try somewhere else, yeah, see, see if we get um, any better uh, treatment um, overseas. Some were attracted by the idea of uh, a better success rate, some 12 cases. I said, well, we went because their success rates were higher than UK clinics. Now, you know, there are lots of issues around how do you measure success, lots of different outcome measures for fertility treatment. Um, and, you know, some UK clinicians will cast aspersions as to how some clinics abroad actually advertise their success rates yeah, on, on their websites. Nevertheless, I think in some cases it is actually true that there is a, a better success rate, and I'll, I'll explain why perhaps later, some treatments. Um, others mentioned uh, techniques that they wanted to try which they thought weren't available in the UK, so really kind of cutting edge uh, new, new ideas, new technologies. For some people, you know, it's the last thing, I just want to try something else, yeah? And if a new technique became available, immune therapy was one at the time, um, it wasn't available here, but we could get it, you know, in the States or whatever. For some people, it was simply a last resort. We've done everything else. We've tried everything else. Yeah? We've done all the treatment, we've moved house, we've, yeah, we've done all the kind of uh, alternative therapies. And this is just one more thing, one more thing that we can try. But the, um, the most common factor for uh, these UK people was their need for third party treatment, their need for donated eggs and sperm, particularly eggs. Okay? That was a major motivating factor for many of them. In the UK, there is a shortage of eggs in particular, but also growing shortages of sperm for donation. Now, some people very, you know, can have successful treatment, but they have to have a donated egg. They, they've had a premature menopause, or they have very poor quality eggs, or the sperm are yeah, not working. Okay, so they need a third party to assist them. And as I say, in the UK, for reasons we can talk about later, but there is a shortage of donated um, gametes. And so over 70% of those that we interviewed needed donor treatment of one kind or another. 59% donor eggs or embryos, 12% donor sperm. And they reported long waiting times in the UK, two years, three years, they were quoted. And many people simply couldn't wait that long. Um, and particularly, actually, we didn't have, um, we did have a, a few um, minority ethnic couples in the study, but we know from other work that we've done around infertility uh, and ethnicity that there is a particular shortage for minority ethnic couples, and, and some people there will be waiting, unless they can bring their own donor, four years, five years, or maybe never. Okay? So it really is quite a significant problem. So a desire for donor treatment, a need for donor treatment, then, was a major factor in our UK people going abroad. But it wasn't by any means the only reason. And this, kind, this does confirm the, um, some of the, the quantitative findings of the Shenfield study that, that I mentioned earlier on. So it's quite kind of interesting. But what's also interesting here is what isn't an issue, what isn't a motivator, what isn't a driver for UK people. I talked about all those legal issues that, you know, what the Belgian women couldn't get treated, they were, the Italians with their restrictive legislation. That's not the case in the UK. The UK has a relatively liberal uh, access to uh, infertility treatment. Uh, there are no, uh, you're not barred on the grounds of marital status or, or sexual orientation. In fact, there isn't even a formal age limit. Although few, few clinics treat women over 50, there isn't a legal limit to that. It's at the, it's at the discretion of, of, of the clinic. So the legal issues are not that important in the UK, uh, in, a, in a strictly uh, defined sense. Yeah? So people don't have to, third party treatment, you can have egg donation treatment, you can have, have donated sperm, embryos, etc. So in that case, yeah, it, it isn't a case of kind of legal restrictions. Also interestingly, this is a small um, study, but um, no one mentioned sex selection. Again, then the media, you know, they're all going to board because they want to choose the, babe, you know, the sex of the baby, and you can do that in the States. No one in our study mentioned that as an issue. And very few mentioned specifically seeking an anonymous donor, and that was another issue that many people felt prior to the study that that might be an issue. In the UK, since um, 2005, 
uh, donors have to be have to agree to be identifiable. So the child, when the child reaches 18, they have a right to know the identity of the donor, right? Not just the kind of genetic history, etc., but actually the, do the donor's identity. Um, and it was felt that uh, some couples did not want to have an anonymous donor. Um, and therefore we're going abroad. We didn't actually find many people stressing that. Some people did mention it, but also some people said, actually, I want to know more about the donor, <laughs> um, and I want my child to know more about the donor than is available in the UK. So, and then there are parts of, as I said, of America where you can have a lot of information about the donor. Or you can have a photo of the donor. You know, in some cases, it's a baby photo, in some cases, an adult photo. You can find out, you know, their SAT score, um, you know, the, whether they're good at tennis, you know, whatever, yeah? I mean, there's a lot of information available. And in some states, you can actually have a relationship with the donor in terms of, you know, you can meet them, etc. all things which are not, not allowed in, uh, in the UK context and European context generally. So, the reasons then were, were kind of complex. Um, and certainly in terms of age, again, we're challenging the media stereotype here. The idea that it's the postmenopausal woman, yeah, they left it too late. Women are always blamed for everything, aren't we? You know, kind of can't have children. You have them too young, you have them too late. Yeah, there's always a, 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 an issue here. You can't win. Um, the idea is that, you know, it, they've, they've left it too late <coughs> and now they need all this help. Well, might be the case, but in, in our study, no, actually. The... The mean female age was 38.8, which is not substantially higher than people having treatment in the UK, similar treatment in the UK, a little bit higher, not that much higher. It, there was a range, 29 to 46. So it, it isn't the, you know, the late 40s on the whole. It isn't the, the kind of postmenopausal women, left it too late women. Um, you know, it's not that dissimilar a picture from those having treatment here. We did have several women over 40, and um, it has to be said that one or two of those had embarked fairly recently on trying to get pregnant. Okay, so I'm not saying that doesn't happen. That there were there were women who, for one reason or another, often quite complex reasons, had only started to get pregnant at 30, 43. Yeah, and obviously, well, I don't know if you know, but. Fertility, I should tell everyone here because it's I think people don't know, but fertility declines extremely rapidly with age. 35, a woman's fertility falls off a cliff, basically, so just bear that in mind. Um, it, it really is a, a, a quite a sharp uh, decline, and also the rate of uh, miscarriage is much, much higher as well in late 30s. So, it, yeah, it is, it is um, an issue. <coughs> age is certainly an issue in terms of fertility. Um, people weren't always aware of that, of course, but also sometimes people would have delayed starting a family for all kinds of complex reasons. They may have been in a long-term relationship. It ends, yeah? <coughs> you're, you're 40, you don't immediately meet somebody that you want to have a child with, yeah? Um, there are all kinds of complex reasons. It isn't simply, oh, well, I'd rather have my job, yeah? For most people, it's much more complex than that. And, of course, we had people who were much younger, people who'd had uh, premature ovarian uh, failure at 29. Yeah? They, had, they needed an egg donor. It's the only way they're ever going to get pregnant. And so for many of them, uh, it was actually the end of a long journey they'd already made in, in fertility treatment in the UK. Some of them had had treatment in the UK for 10 years before they moved on to, to, to going abroad. They might have started off with relatively... Uh, simple, uh, non-invasive treatment, uh, drug treatment, IUI, gone through several cycles of IVF, and now we're at an age where an egg donor was the only way they were ever going to get pregnant. Okay, so it might it sort of started a, a kind of journey, and for some of them that journey then ends up actually in another country altogether. Right, where did they go? Were they all going to these terrible dodgy clinics? Well, I'm sure some of the clinics were a little bit dodgy, but on the whole, people were pretty smart about making their decisions of where to go. Okay, these weren't, you know, totally uninformed consumers. Quite the reverse, they were in fact well informed. They'd done extensive <coughs> research. 
they looked very carefully at, at the clinics and the, what information there was about them. They'd asked each other, all right, via the internet forum about the standards in, of care in different clinics. Okay, so they'd actually done quite a lot of research, t taken quite a kind of responsible um, position. Many of them went within Europe, but the destinations, as you can see here, were actually quite varied. Uh, 13 different countries, I think, in total. Very popular destinations, Spain, the Czech Republic, particularly for those requiring donors, because donors are more plentiful there. Several people had actually been to more than one country for treatment, and four people had children from more than one country. That's quite an interesting thought. And then several people would have frozen embryos, remember, because there are many frozen embryos sometimes left over from treatment in more than one country. Okay, Still there, waiting for um, decisions to be taken. Um, but on the whole, uh, I'm sure that uh, most European clinics would not regard themselves as dodgy, unsafe clinics. Um, and uh, European standards generally are, are, are good. And in the US, they have some of the best clinics in the world. So, uh, again, I think challenging the, the media stereotype a little bit there. What about the outcomes? Are they all having triplets? No. No, they're not. Um, again, limitations of small numbers and, and a qualitative study. But <coughs> we can't claim representativeness. But in terms of the outcomes of the people that we interviewed, most of this big controversy in uh, ART as to how many embryos you transfer to a woman. And increasingly, in Europe, they're moving towards single embryo transfer, elective single embryo transfer, to reduce the numbers of multiple births. Because having twins and having triplets is not a good idea on the whole. It has increased risks for both the, the baby and the mother. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. One at a time is much better. Um, but the, the, rate follow, the rate of multiples following IVF has always been higher than, um, than naturally. But in fact, increasingly, even within, within the broader European context, uh, people are transferring fewer embryos. And two embryos, at the time we did the study, two embryo transfer would be the norm in the UK. Okay? So it's not that different. And in fact, interestingly... Again, there's this idea that they're going to India, particularly India was meant, it's often mentioned in these accounts, you know, having all these you know, embryos transferred. Five embryos one woman had. Hoo hoo, scary thought. Five embryos transferred. Where do you think that was? In the USA. Okay. In one of the top clinics in the world in the USA. Okay. Now, yeah, that <coughs> woman actually had a singleton birth, and no one in our study mentioned. Um, fetal reduction. So maybe it was the, the appropriate treatment for, for that woman. So the twin pregnancy rate then, which uh, was around 19%, again, is the same as, very similar to, the rate in the UK for IVF treatment at the time of the study, Okay, especially if you look at um, similar patients. So it isn't higher. It's the same as the UK. So, again, another way that, that I think the study has kind of challenged this kind of dominant media um, uh, image. Um, and, and for many, I mean, the value, I think, of our study is it, it, it allowed us to, to hear the women's voices, really, for the first time. There really hadn't been any qu qualitative research and very <coughs> little, uh, any kind of research on this. It's allowed us to hear the women's voice in particular, also the men, which is kind of quite interesting, too, to have some... Um, some of the men's responses here. And for many of them, they didn't really see it as a choice, this kind of flippant image of tourism. They hated the word tourism. They really did not like that, with all its connotations of you know, pleasure and leisure. If anyone has been anywhere near IVF treatment, let me tell you, it isn't a pleasurable experience. Yeah? It's very, very, it's physically demanding. There are all kinds of, you know, it's invasive treatment. It's emotionally extremely demanding treatment. It ain't fun, okay? So the idea that you know that this is, you know, some kind of jaunt, yeah, it was very offensive and hurtful to to the women that we spoke to. Um, their position was, you know, you don't do this lightly. You really don't, yeah. They, the press, belittle it. 
making it sound like it's on the spur of the moment kind of thing. Oh, by the way, let's have IVF treatment while we're here. As if people would do that. They don't seem to realise how desperate people are to have a family. To do that, to go to a foreign country, it's even harder than having treatment here. Okay? No one chooses to go abroad for treatment unless they really have to. It's inconvenient, it's scary, it's hard. I just think if our provision was better, people wouldn't need to do it. Okay? So for many women, then, it wasn't really a choice in their eyes. It was a response to an otherwise impossible situation. So is it something we need to be worried about? Well, yes and no. I mean, clearly for those women involved, those couples involved, it's a solution rather than a problem. I mean, they, some of them anyway. We had 26 um, pregnancies, yeah? They, you know, some of them, they, they got the baby they, they wanted. And even those that didn't achieve a pregnancy or have a child uh, reported their experiences as broadly positive, which was actually quite, quite interesting. There were very few of the sort of horror stories that we heard about, so you hear, read about in the press. It's not without its challenges, it's not an easy thing to do, but on the whole, people reported very positive experiences, high standards of care, feeling well cared for, yeah, in some cases, positive outcomes. So quite kind of interesting. But nevertheless, having said that, satisfied customers, there are nevertheless, I think, issues uh, of concern for women in particular in this practice. Um, and I just briefly <coughs> want to mention some of these as I, as I finish. The, the welfare of women who are users of overseas uh, ARTs uh, and their families really, I think, has to be, there has to be an issue here for us to, to talk about. Of course, all, all fertility treatment involves um, a level of risk, bodily risk, physical risk, as well as emotional risk, as I've said earlier. And remember that most people come out the other end, do not get a baby. Okay, So there's all that um, to deal with as well. And I think fertility tourism, for some women, it kind of literally expands the boundaries of treatment. Yeah? People will put themselves through you know, an awful lot to, to, to try to have a child. Immense um, amount of, of um, distress and suffering and, and pain and cost in order to <coughs> have a child. And it's very hard to stop treatment. Some people find it hard to stop treatment. And this is one more, one more thing to try. And uh, when this is in a commercial environment, I think you just sometimes have to ask yourself, is it always being done in the best interests of women to extend, extend treatment almost indefinitely? Okay? Um, because this is about making money. It's commerce. It's, it's a commercial <coughs> enterprise. No matter how we kind of wrap it up, yeah? most of this is big business. It's, made, it's a huge business globally, billions, 25, 250 billion pound industry worldwide. Um, so there are, you know, it's commerce, it, it, it's, it's, it's capitalism, it's, you know, uh, and are we actually, um, are, we, are we in danger of exploiting yeah, people here and vulnerable people in, in particular? Are, we give, are women being given the hard sell? You know? Everyone's making money here. The egg brokers, there are egg brokers, the sperm banks, yeah? the, the providers of treatment. Or is that okay? Are women actually um, well-informed consumers, free agents, able to make these decisions? Yeah? Should be free to make these decisions. It's, a, it's an interesting kind of debate. It sort of challenges... I think some of the feminist uh, ideas are, uh, I think, quite, quite um, interestingly. In the absence of international <coughs> regulation of the industry worldwide, there isn't any international regulation. So, how do patients know? Yeah, trustworthy. How how do they know that the information they're getting from clinics is is trustworthy? It's it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and it's uh, the onus is very much on the patient to evaluate the trustworthiness and the reliability of the information. And that's quite hard. There are issues, I think, around safety. Um, you know, in infertility, there's a lot of risks here. You know, screening donors, yeah? You can't have just anybody. The whole lab process, as we've heard recently this week, of things going awry in, uh, in um, Wales again. Um, 
And in some parts of the country, there is, uh, the world rather, there is very little regulation. Yeah? We are well regulated in the UK and in most of Europe and parts of the US, although that's uh, more professional regulation. But there are some parts of the world where there isn't. So our, you know, and, you know, we, we have to be reliant there on professional responsibilities to ensure safety of patients. And where there's commerce involved, yeah, we, we have to kind of think hard about that. In terms of legal redress, uh, what <coughs> happens if something goes wrong? What happens? What legal redress have patients got if something goes wrong? Some, some countries have very weak malpractice laws. You can find yourself in a lot of difficulty. There are the dangers of multiple pregnancies. We didn't find that in our study, but that doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist. If you talk to fetal medicine specialists in the UK, many of them will say they do see multiple pregnancies. That's not being quantified. Okay? And that's not good for anybody, mother, child, or, in fact, the healthcare system. There are legal complications uh, in this whole matter, especially around surrogacy. Uh, you know, it's a legal minefield. We've got stateless babies. We've got babies to five sets of parents. We've got disputes about who is the legal parent. Okay, gives rise to all kinds of um, legal um, argument. There's the welfare of donor-conceived children and donor-conceived families. And now, involving um, a third party <coughs> is a difficult option for many people. Um, and in the case of overseas donation. Um, some people do use identity release donors, but in many cases the donors are, on, are anonymous. So the child, the family, the child will never be able to know from an overseas um, treatment the identity of their donor. Um, and that uh, increasingly gives rise to concern among some people. Very much depends on where you stand on that whole issue. Um, but many people regard increasingly it's important to have openness and disclosure and uh, that won't be available for those families in particular. And then, finally, last but by no means least, there is the welfare of gamete providers and the surrogates. Who are the women that are providing these eggs? Yeah? It's a, a, a kind of, well, marginally dangerous process. I mean, you have to take hefty lots of drugs. They can have side effects. Uh, it can be life-threatening. It's not just a matter of, you know, it's not like the guys, which is a bit easier. Um, for women, you know, it, it's serious stuff. And, um, you know, obviously pregnancy, if you're a surrogate, carrying a child is not without its risks, okay? So it's not, it it's, has its risks, physical risks, and emotional risks as well to donation uh, and surrogacy. Um, and... We don't know anything about the egg providers. We know very, very little about the people who are, who are doing this, who are, in fact, in, in many contexts, selling the, their eggs and renting their wombs for the use of other women. And we really know very little about the, their motivation, about their welfare. You know, are they going from one clinic to another, donating time after time? What impact is that having on their bodies, on their f future fertility? Okay. So we, we really need to know an awful lot more about um, <coughs> the, 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 the women in particular who are um, providing, effectively providing the means to, 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 to allow this um, treatment. And as I say, it, it, it raises a lot of issues for feminists in particular because what, we, what we're seeing here with all infertility treatment, there is a kind of stratified reproduction. You can't actually have it unless you've got money. Yeah? Many parts of the world there is no fertility treatment available for women. They just don't have the money, the means to, to have it. Um, and here we've got a situation of richer women in the West often using the eggs and the bodies of poorer women. Not exclusively, because we, you know, we do have richer women in, in the West donating as well. But you know, there is a kind of relationship there um, which some people would be very critical of in terms of its um, potential uh, you know, for, for exploitation. Um, and again, it's uh, an ongoing debate with, with very little resolution. But I think, you know, we do need to think, are we actually perpetuating a form of stratified reproduction yeah, and, and patriarchal practices here? Um, and I think it's an interesting question to ask, you know, in an equal world, who, who would sell their eggs or rent their womb? 
I'm not sure that many people would. Thank you. Hi, Paula. Thanks, that was really interesting. And I was thinking about your middle point on this slide about the welfare of donor conceived children. Yeah. They come with a very high expectation though, don't they? You know, the, we've gone to such lengths to have you. Yeah. You've got to live up to. Yeah. Our expectations are yeah. really done. Yeah. There's, there, there's quite a bit of work actually now done on uh, donor conceived families. Uh, Susan Gollenbock at Cambridge, <coughs> uh, mainly, mainly from within psychology and developmental psychology, and they're doing some interesting longitudinal work, wh which is going to be fascinating, I think. And as far as they've, they've got with that research, actually, they do real well. You know, it's not, um, you know, that, yeah, from what you, you're saying, you might have, you might be concerned about that because of the expectations, but actually, uh, you know, developmentally fine. There don't seem to be major issues within families. Um, it, it's actually very positive, um, the work that, that's coming through there. Interestingly, though, this is, for many of those families, it was probably pre the disclosure issue, and still, it's still the case that uh, many parents don't disclose the use of third parties, uh, although it's now encouraged that, that people you know, don't necessarily do that. And I think people would argue that that's where then you can have difficulties within family because it's secrets and, you know, sometimes they're revealed in difficult circumstances and then there is upset. Of course, it's very difficult to do research in this area because who's going to come forward? It's only the people that have disclosed. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's a minefield methodologically. Any questions? Yeah. Can I ask where you got your sample of women from? Was it from an internet based? Yeah. Well, lo lots of different sources actually. Clearly, not an easy thing to try and to try and get. Um, so there obviously is kind of selection bias there. But we did, I think, four four main sources. So we got some from the internet forum. We got some through uh, clinics, actually, in the UK, where there were some links. And uh, we got them from um, patient support groups. And we got them from snowballing and word of mouth. I actually went on Woman's Hour. Oh, that was so scary. I actually was interviewed by Jenny Murray uh, early on in the study, who's absolutely, she's such a, a hero of mine. It was like really nerve wracking. Um, but we advertised the study there, and quite a few people got in touch from that, actually. Uh, it was on the website. <coughs> and, uh, because we, we were coming at it, and these people felt terribly judged, you know, and, and uh, you know, they, they were pretty angry, some of them, and they wanted to say, look, it isn't like that. And obviously, bit this being an academic study, hopefully, a, you know, with a more neutral stance. And we did have a few people come forward from that as well. So a variety of different ways. We have, we don't, I don't really know. We, we've not obviously kind of followed them up uh, long term. I certainly some of them had considered adoption anyway, you know, be before doing this. Um, but then often, you know, you, you run into problems there as well. <coughs> so if you're older or, yeah, um, you don't kind of fit the sort of stereotype of, of you know, what, the, what adoption agencies are seeking or whatever. So many of them had actually thought about adoption. Whether they then go on if they're unsuccessful to do that, I have no idea, but it's certainly a possibility. It would be quite interesting to follow them up and, and, and see what happens. But as I say, they, they were on the whole, they were really quite positive about their experience, which is quite <coughs> amazing, really. If you think of it, not an easy thing to do, is it? But um, And they were very supportive of each other as well. If you go on the internet sites, it's amazing. It's like, well, when you go to the Czech Republic, you can fly here from there. They've got the cheap flights. This is a really good hotel to stay in. You can get a taxi from there to the... You know, they were really um, supporting each other in practical terms and logistics, but also emotionally as well. Very important, those sites. Okay. Thank you.